everyone. In this video, I'm going to go over the events uh, API group. This is the main one you'll be looking at, right? These are creating the calendar events, um, you know, editing them, um, adding them to calendars, things like that, importing events. Um, so I'm first going to go over all the resources here, and then we will look at how it looks like in Bubble. Okay, so now I'm on the overview here. You can see events overview, and let's go one by one and kind of look at them, and then we'll look at the individual calls. So first of all, anyone can add self. We can see that this one is deprecated, not important for us, uh, but it is writable. We're going to skip that. Attachments, I will go over in another video. I won't go over that currently. Um, let's go over attendees. Okay, so the only things, the only parameters we're actually looking at, you know, you may think, oh, I can just copy this as the whole body. But so many of these parameters are not relevant, right? Like, um, this isn't writable. You know, anything that's not writable, meaning editable using the API, uh, is not relevant for us. So let's go over attendees. Okay, so attendees, um, very simple structure. You have a list of attendees, um, and then you can add them. Um, you can add them. I just add them using an email address, but you can also add a display name, a comment, um, additional guests. So like if you have an attendee which has additional guests, um, attendees ID, so that's not writable, right? So we're not going to add that in any of the API calls. Attendees optional. Um, so in this, every attendee you add will have all these parameters, a comment, display name, email. I just specify, I think, the email and that's it, but you can add a few of these, display name, comment, um, organizer, and then optional. Do you want this attendee to be optional to the meeting? Um, and then attendees resource, not, not sure what that is, um, so we'll skip it. And then response status. Um, so always, you know, if you're sending out an invite, you want to do like needs action, you know, to prompt them to accept or decline, but you can also add uh, accepted or declined. Um, attendees self, um, look, this isn't writable. So this basically says whether, I think it says whether this is like, whether this is you, you know, in the list of attendees. So this will be in a response to an API call. If you pull the event and then it has a bunch of attendees and then you're one of the attendees, then it and then it will say self as true on that. And then color ID, um, that is essentially, we will go over the colors API calls over here. And they're essentially, Google Calendar has a list of colors that uh, you can use. A list of color IDs, which are kind of like their standard colors for uh, events. Um, and so it would be a like color ID and then it would be like one or something or two or three or something like that. Um, and one thing to note is that although it's going to be a number, it's a string value. So meaning you would have to put it in quotation marks in um, an API call, I believe. Uh, conference data. Okay, so conference data is important. So if you do not want, remember, you don't have to add all these parameters. If you do not want um, there to be a conference solution, and all they allow is Google Meets or the Google um, allowed conference solution, video conference solution. So if you don't, you should skip this if you don't want to add a conference solution. To, like if you don't want to add a Google Meet link, to your uh, calendar events, you should not add this. Um, but if you do, essentially there's conference data and then conference data has a, it, it's, it, there's a lot of stuff here. The only thing you really need to know is like create request. Um, so when conference data slash create request, and then you're gonna put in like which solution key and then conference create request has sub data which is conference solution key and then conference solution key it has an object which includes type and so you're just going to choose in my case it's just hangouts meet for google meet i don't know i don't know if anybody uses hangouts anymore um, but if you do you can and then requested id i don't think you even add yeah status none of these things are important entry points Oh, scratch that. The only thing you need is a request ID. Request ID is an ID that you create for the meeting. Um, so 
client generated unique ID. You can generate it however you want, whatever you want to call the ID. And then um, just this uh, nested object type. So what type of link you want to add, and then it will add a Google Meet link to your um, to your event. And then I think you can add entry points, like whether you want it to be video or phone call, but I won't, uh, uh, I'm not going to go into that. And you can see there's a bunch of stuff here, like meeting code, that's not writable. That's where you would get back if you get the uh, event. Uh, let's scroll down here, creator, all this stuff is not writable. Let's go to writable stuff. So description of the event, pretty self-explanatory. And then end, and then end has a end nested date time and time zone. So you're just gonna use a specific format, RFC 339 for the date time and the time zone to um, Diana. This is also a kind of protocol for how to write the correct time zone. Now to get a date time, this is, you can go to this website and I, um, it's unixtimestamp.com. You can enter in a date and time and then you can scroll down and you can see we have RFC 3339 here and this would be the format um, that it would accept. Um, I will go over in bubble kind of how to how to work with this in later videos, but essentially to, to test it out, you can use unixtimestamp.com. And, okay, so let's go back here. Uh, and then time zone, um, Ayana time. Um, yeah, you could probably pull this somewhere. I just searched the one I'm in currently, or you can use this example here at Zurich. Um, and you could probably get the list and put it in your bubble app um, if you are making it dynamic. But the truth is, the, the you don't need a time zone because the date and time contains an offset, which is essentially the time zone. Here is plus zero zero, but it may be plus three. And so you don't need the time zone if you don't want to. I added it in here. Not sure exactly why in my examples. Um, so you, you should be fine with just the date time. And then e tag, not important, event type, not important, read only. Um, extended properties is another important concept I want to go over. Extended properties are properties that go in API calls. So it's not on the event itself. And it's just a way to keep track on your back end of like custom parameters and so what i mean there is like each parameter has a key and value pair so for example if you're organizing an event for a uh i don't know uh dog meetup okay and then you want to add a property that says cats allowed yes no or dog name then you can add that via api um so, so extended properties um, can be added. So for example, yeah, if you want to allow pets, you can uh, add an extended property to the event. And it is data that is not stored in the event. They can't see it on their calendar event, but you can pull it, it's metadata. So it's not anything that's actually visible on their calendar. But using the API, you can pull that data. When you call the event, you'll see that data. Um, and then there are two types. There's private and share. Share just means if somebody who's added to the event pulls the event using the API, um, they can see that shared extended property. And private just means only you can see that shared extended property. Um, and this is just a way to keep track in the back end or make changes in the back end. Or if you have like an app that's working with Google Calendar, you can keep track of these um, extended property. And I will show how this looks in the bubble editor. All right, um, guests can modify, guests can invite others. These are just basic parameters, true, false. I skipped gadget because it says it's deprecated. Gadgets are deprecated, okay. So not, not really important for us. Um, guests can invite others. Okay, true, not, guests can modify. These are pretty. 
just gets the other guests. These are pretty uh, self-explanatory. Hangouts link, not important. HTML link, not writable. ID, if you create, if you do not specify an ID, it will automatically generate an ID. No reason why you should need to generate your own ID. Okay, location is important because location in Google Calendar can be a, you know, actual location. You know, you can enter a location, but it's free text. So a lot of times, you know, people will put uh, Zoom link. Uh, so this would be the place to put the Zoom link if you have one uh, in the location field. Uh, what else is writable? Organizer, okay. You can specify the organizer. Organizer display name, organizer email. Um, so yeah, you can specify the organizer if you like. It follows the same structure of the attendees. So I don't think I have this in the bubble app, but um, follows the same structure. Original start time, original start time. This says it's writable, uh, but actually when you're creating a recurring event, this is why this is relevant. Um, you know, there's an original time and then there's all the other times that it happens. This is not, you don't need to create this add these even if you're creating a recurring event and I tested that. So I would just ignore the original start time for now. When you're calling instances of a recurring event, then you will see the original start time and that's an important, you know, thing to know so that um so that you know, you can see when it like the original uh, event started. Um so now, this is important, recurrence. Um, I split up creating a single event and a recurring event in my bubble app, uh, but recurrence essentially follows this like interesting format called RFC 5545. And essentially it's a bunch of rules that says like, okay, how often do you want this to recur? Okay, you want it to recur daily, weekly, monthly, until what time, until what date? And, um, Google has like an interesting uh, overview on how to do this, uh, recurrence rules. Um, I will link to this in the YouTube video description, or you can just um, search in Google explaining the Google Calendar API. I'll go to the first link, go to calendars and events and scroll down. And you can see kind of what these rules are. Our rule, you can read about them. Um, and then like they give some examples like, Recurrence, our rule frequency weekly count five by day, Tuesday and Friday. So it's only Tuesday and Friday weekly um, up until five weeks. So these are like our rules. And then I have this Interfun website where you can generate the rules. Um, and I will link to this again. It is actually not in the description. It will be in the bubble app in my bubble app, there's a resources page and here I have all the resources that I have used. And so you can generate over here kind of an R rule or whatever rule uh, you want, which is cool. And when I go over an example of this in a later videos, I will show you how to generate it within bubble. Um, okay, cool. So recurrences, essentially you can have multiple rules. Um, that's why it's a list. Um, yeah, where were we? Yeah, recurrence. So there's multiple rules, right? Um, so, you know, recurs X dates weekly and then doesn't recur on this time or this date and exceptions. So that's why it's a list of recurrence rules based on this format. Uh, recurrent event ID that's returnable. Okay, reminders override. So when you create a calendar, you set default reminders. Um, or a calendar list entry, but I'll go over that in other videos. You set the default reminders. So like 15 minutes before, um, 30 minutes before, um, um, you know, 20 minutes before, send everyone an email. So this is kind of like if you want to override those defaults that you set for the calendar for this specific event, then you can add them in here. And the structure is pretty simple. It's just reminders and then overrides. And then overrides is a list. 
Um, and then the list has a method, email, I just use email, and then minutes before the meeting. So you can have 15 minutes before the meeting as one object and 30 minutes before the meeting as another object. And then reminders, you use default. So if you're using default, you won't you know, have these overrides. Um, um, or you cannot use default and have these overrides uh, be used. I think you may be able to use them together, so have both, uh, but I'm not sure about that. Sequence the number, sequence number as per I calendar. Okay, not sure what this is. I don't think you need it. Source, okay. So source.title and source.url. So in your Google Calendar, um, let's just go to an event. You can add this thing that is like a source and you can set the title. And this could be like, the source is from uh, your website, which is, let's say it's a scheduling website. It's my scheduler uh, by, I don't know, Wise Bubbler. And then they can click here and you can add a URL. Um, so the structure is pretty simple. It's like source and then the object, single object with a title and a URL. Pretty explanatory. And then start date time is the same as end date time. I think we went over that. You have to specify, it's required for every event. You have to specify a start date time, end date time. And you can have a date, which would just be like all day events. And you can also specify the time zone. Um, and then status. Okay, so status, you can change the status or create a status. Obviously, when you create an event, you're going to want to keep it as is. And then, okay, and then summary, you know, that's like the title of the event. Pretty simple, just a string, you know. Um, transparency, okay, so. So this is actually interesting. Um, this, you can have two values here. So transparency and you can have it opaque, which um, doesn't block time on the calendar. So you won't be marked as busy for that time. So if there's like a conflict, I don't know if you use Google Calendar or not, like a conflict. And then transparent, oh no, transparent doesn't block a time on a calendar. Opaque blocks a time uh, on the calendar. So decide that. And then visibility, uh, do you want it to, default value of the calendar or public or private. So this is only for attendees and then visible to everyone. Again, this is string, pretty simple. So that was an overview of all the resources that we went through. Um, in the next video, I will go over kind of how that looks, API call by API call. And then first how it looks, you know, here in the documentation and then how it looks um, in Bubble itself as in, in the API connector. Thanks for watching.